In my previous videos, we've talked about measures of center, the mean, the median, the mode. Uh, we've talked about measures of variation or measures, measures of spread, the standard deviation, the variance. Now I want to talk about measures of relative standing. Now, the difference with measures of relative standing is we're looking at data values relative to the set that they live in, not relative to other sets. So what I mean by relative standing, so this is the, the key term here, relative standing. This quartiles and box plots are more specific topics that I'll talk about later on in these notes. Uh, but let's say, for example, you're, uh, you're in a class, you take an exam, and you score a 85%. How do you feel about that? Well, maybe you feel a little bit differently if you knew that was the highest grade in the class. Maybe it was a really difficult exam. No one got an A. Maybe no one else got a B except you. And your 85 was the highest grade in the class. Maybe you feel pretty good about that. Or maybe you take a test and your score is an 85 and it's the lowest grade in the class. Maybe everyone else got an A except you and you have the, the lone B. Maybe in that case, the same grade, 85, doesn't feel so good. So it's relative to the other values in the set or the other scores in the set. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about here with relative standing. And the first thing I want to talk about is z-scores. Uh, I've talked, I talked about z-scores a little bit in a previous video, but I want to just re-emphasize their importance. They're very fundamentally important to statistics. And it's basically a z-score is a unit. It's a unit of measurement. So there's centimeters, feet, uh, miles, pounds, dollars. Z-scores are just another unit of measurement. And just like you can convert between other units. You could say, well, uh, uh, two gallons equals eight quarts. So you could convert between gallons and quarts, or one mile is 5,280 feet. You can convert between feet and miles. Well, you can convert between any of those units and z-scores. Now, the z-score is the number of standard deviations from the mean. It's the number of standard deviations about the mean. Let me... Uh, yeah, let's go here. Okay, so... When we convert to z-scores, and I have a separate video on z-scores, and there's a link to that video in these notes. When we convert to z-scores, we're converting based on the individual value that you're converting, also the mean and the standard deviation of that set. Now, one thing we use z-scores for is to determine what are unusual values, unusually high or unusually low values. And the cutoff for that is a z-score of two. So remember, z-score is number of standard deviations above the mean. So if the mean is zero, then if a value is more than two standard deviations up from the mean, we call that an unusual value. If it's less than, or if it's more than two standard deviations below the mean. We also call that an unusual value. Now, we have this term z-score just because repeating over and over the term number of standard deviations is a little cumbersome. So instead of saying, this x value is 3.7 standard deviations above the mean, we just say this z-score, this x value has a z-score of 3.7. Okay, so that, that's all it is. It's number of standard deviations above the mean. Okay, so we have, uh, you know, for example, the standard deviation. This is one number per set. So if you have a set of 100 numbers, that set has one standard deviation has one variance, it has one mean, it has one median, uh, it may have more than one mode, but let's not talk about modes. So rather than 
Rather than characterizing the set as a whole, a z-score characterizes an individual value. Each x value, each element in the set, has its own z-score. Right, so if you have a set with 50 numbers, it's going to have 50 z-scores. And this right here, this is our really important definition of the term z-score. The z-score of a data value x, so we have x is the variable that represents our original data. The z-score of a data value is the number of standard deviations between that data value and the mean. So z-scores could be positive if you're above average. Z-scores will be negative if you're below average. Okay, and it's a really important topic. We're gonna to be using it throughout the course. It's like, as I've said, it's a unit of measurement. It's the number of standard deviations from the mean. And above the mean, you have positive Z-scores. Below the mean, you have negative Z-scores. Now there's a couple of ways to calculate Z-scores. You could use a calculator in the textbook formula. Uh, which is this, or you could use Excel. And so basically, you have the difference between an individual X value and the mean of the set. And then you standardize that by dividing by the standard deviation. Okay, so it's X minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So you could use these formulas, or you could click on this link, and this will take you to a... Um, uh, to a, another video lecture where I explain quickly and easily how to use Excel to calculate z-scores. Okay, we've, uh, we've talked about already ordinary and unusual. So for example, oh, so, so this term, let's just, before I move on to the next slide, this term unusual, uh, it's not black and white. It's not just you're, you're either one or the other. There are, you know, one value could be more unusual than another value. Think about what's, uh, how likely is it to be walking down the street and see someone who is six foot nine inches tall? Well, we'll, we'll talk about specifically how to later, but trust me when I say that is statistically unusual based on this definition. So seeing someone who is six foot nine uh, inches tall is statistically unusual. But seeing someone who's seven foot four is more unusual. So you, there's, there's levels to being unusual. Uh, for example, what is more unusual? You're on a safari and you see a giraffe. That is, oh, this should say 23 feet. It is down here. That should say 23 feet tall. Sorry. What's more unusual, seeing a giraffe that is 23 feet tall, or you're in the ocean and you see a great white shark who's 24 feet long? Now, both of these are above average. So here, down here is your information for giraffes. They have an average height of 16.3 feet with a standard deviation of 3.3. So that 23 foot giraffe is definitely above average. Now, the great white sharks have an average length of 15.6 feet with a standard deviation of 4.8 feet. So a 24 foot great white shark is also above average. Both of them unusually above average. Now the question is, which one which one of these two is more unusual? And we do that by converting the information that we're given into z-scores. And again, you could click my link or I have this problem worked out on Excel. All right, so that's it for a discussion on z-scores. I wanna talk about something you may have heard of before, the idea of a percentile. It's another way of sort of quantifying how, uh, where one X value lies relative to the other X values in that set. 
Now, if you've ever taken a standardized test like the ACT or the SAT or something like this, uh, you'll receive your score both as a raw score and a percentile. And if that, if you score in the 88th percentile, that means your test grade is higher than 88% of the other thousands of people who took that test. Or if you're watching this and you have children, um, when children are infants and you take them to the doctors, they weigh them, they do the, the length and the head circumference and all of these things, and they give you a, a result in terms of a percentile. Where does your child fall in the percentile rank for weight or for length? Things like this. So it's a measure of location. Location. And when I say location, a measure of location within the set. Within the set. So where does that, where does that value lie? If you put all the values in order, in numerical order, smallest to largest, a percentile is a location of where a value lies in that set relative to the other values. Now, this is really important here, and it's also really annoying. There is no one agreed upon method for calculating percentiles. If you pick up three different statistics books, you might get three different formulas that give you three different answers. And then if you use Excel to calculate percentile, well, there's two more formulas on Excel for two different ways to calculate percentile. So it's really, really important. This is an anomaly in a statistic, in a statistics course. Normally, there's one way to do things, and if you pick up any stats book, it's always the same way. But for this particular topic, I am going to use the methods that correspond to the textbook I'm using. And so there's one method, which is sort of paper and pencil method, and then one method on Excel, just like everything else. Uh, just if you, you know, if, if you're looking at my notes, or my video, and then you Google how to find percentiles, you might get a different, you know, something that doesn't align with what we're doing. And that's not going to happen for any other topic in the course, course just for percentiles. All right, so just keep that in mind moving forward. So, as I said, percentiles are measure of location. And there's, there's two ways that the problems could sort of play out. If you have an X value, figure out where it's located. Or if you have the location, figure out what X value is in that location. Those are the two types of problems down here. Now, so let's talk about the first one. Given an X value, calculate its percentile. So, basically, you have your values in order. So, let's, uh, let's come up with some random numbers. 14, 27, 29. Okay, so let's say I want to know what is the percentile for the 14? convert that X value to a percentile. So, very simple. How many numbers are less than 14? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. There's six numbers. And how many numbers are there in total? nine numbers. And that's it. That's all. You divide those two numbers. The, the number of values less than X, so in this case that would be a 6, and the no total number of values that would be a 9. 6 divided by 9 is 0 0.6 repeating. 
And we have a times 100 here, and that's to convert the decimal to a percent. All right. And that's it. To convert an x value to its percentile, you divide the num how many numbers are less than x and how many numbers are there in the set. Now, in the other direction, 5 the x value if you are uh, if you know the percentile say you have a big set of numbers what is the uh, 78th percentile on the list so we're using l cuz it's a percentiles percentiles are locations percentiles are locations so we're using l so the location of that percentile is equal to, well, k is the percentile you're looking for. So k over 100. So if I want the, if I want the 38th percentile, I have to convert that 38% to a decimal. That's what the over 100 is for. So I would say L equals 38 over 100. Or you can just write 0.38 times the total number of number or the times the size of your set times n and one of two things is going to happen so when you convert or when you calculate this number l you either get a whole number or you don't that's it there are only two options you get a whole number or a decimal if you get a whole number you're over here in this box if you get a decimal you're over here in this box so if L is a whole number you don't use L you use the halfway point between L and the next number so if you calculate the 38th percentile you get L equals 7 you would use the halfway point between 7 and 8 if you get L, if you calculate L and it's a decimal, you change L by rounding up to the next number. So if you calculate L, and, and this is important because we're not using normal rounding rules. If you calculate L, and for example, L is equal to 7.7, .7, use the eighth position, you round up. If you get L is equal to 11.1, .1, you use 12, the 12th position. You don't follow normal rounding rules. Normally, 11.1 .1 would round down to 11, not 12, but you always round up by rounding it up to the next larger whole number. Uh, uh, later on in this... Uh, Later on in these notes, somewhere, yeah, there's this slide. This comes later. This is slide 25. I'll, you know, we'll eventually hit this. If you click on this link, it takes you to a video lecture where you see me working through Excel both ways. You'll see this sort of flow chart on my Excel page, and I do the same problem both ways. So I work through. Uh, finding a percentile using this method and then I work through the exact same problem using Excel so you see the side-by-side -side method and so I highly recommend uh, watching that video immediately uh, after this one okay now percentiles are any location between 1 and 99 and there's a few of them that are of um, high importance, more important than the others. So the 25th percentile, we give that a special name. It's the first quartile. So it just means it's the location that cuts the first quarter of the data set from the top three quarters of the data set. So the first quartile sort of does this. It groups 
it, it separates the, the first 25% with the upper 75%. Uh, the second quarter, second quartile is the 50th percentile and the 50th percentile or the second quartile. This is the only one. This is the only percentile that you will always get the same answer, no matter what method you use, because we've already defined this previously in the measures of center discussion. And the median is the middle value. The median is the value that splits a set up into two equal parts, the lower 50% and the upper 50%. So second quartile is the median. First quartile, you might get five different answers if you use five different books. All right, and so these three numbers, in addition with the minimum and the maximum, so we have the, the, the lowest number, the highest number, the halfway point, which is the median. And the first quartile is basically the median of the first half, and the third quartile is basically the median of the second half. These five numbers collectively are called the five number summary. And we use this five number summary for a number of things. One, to analyze the distribution, to easily analyze the distribution of a set and graph that distribution, which we'll talk about later. Those are called box plots. Uh, to compare the distributions between different sets and to identify what are called outlying values. Now an outlier, oh, and this will come back to the interquartile range. That's just whatever is this number and this number. The third and first quartiles, you get those two numbers and you subtract them, and that's the interquartile range. Now we use the interquartile range. Now we've talked about the word range before. The range, let me use a different color. So this, these two give you the interquartile range, while these two give you the range, the regular range, the range we talked about in our last video on measures of variation. So it's just one number, subtract these two, you get the range, or you subtract these two, you get the interquartile range. Now, an outlier, informally put, is a value that lies very far away from the vast majority of other values in the set. It's, 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 it's an unusually high or unusually low number. When you watched my video on measures of center on Excel, there were 12 house prices and all of the houses were uh, in the, the 200 to 400 thousand dollar range except one house was a was listed at 2.2 million and in the video i said okay that is an outlying value that's an outlier it's unusually high and i also mentioned later we'll talk about how to specifically determine that um, rather than just assume it's true so that's what we're doing here an outlier is a value that's really high or really low relative to the other values in the set. It can have, and as you saw this in, in the video on the, the 12 house prices, can have a dramatic effect on the mean and the standard deviation, which will have a dramatic effect on the scale of the histogram, which shows the distribution uh, of the data set. Now, definition. An outlier is any value above the mean, or sorry, any value that's above the third quartile by this much, by one and a half of the interquartile ranges, or below the first quartile by this much. Now, what that means is, let's just do a, a, a basic example. Here's uh, Here's the number line and here's Q2 and let's say this is Q1 and this is Q3. So the interquartile range is this distance. So in this case, if Q1 is seven and Q3 is 13, subtract the two, you get six. So the interquartile range would be Six. 
Now you take one and a half of these. So one and a half sixes. So 1.5 times 6 gives you 9. So that's, this 9 is 1.5 of the interquartile range. So we said Q1, Q2, Q3, and then over here is Q3 plus 9, and over here is Q1 minus 9. So anything over here is an outlier. Anything above the number Q3 plus 9. So in this case, 13 plus 9. So Q1 is 7, and Q3 is 13. And then 1.5 of the interquartile range is above Q3 would put you at 22. So anything above 22 is an outlier. And if we take Q1 minus 9, we'll have negative 2. So anything below negative 2 is an outlier. All right, and so that's basically it. And then we that takes us to this slide, which I showed earlier. In this video, I go through percentiles, quartiles, uh, interquartile range, outliers. I go through everything over the last 15 or so slides, both using the textbook method in a calculator and using Excel. Now a box plot, sometimes called a box and whisker plot, is just a picture of that five number summary that we just talked about. So the five number summary is the minimum, the maximum, the first quartile, the second quartile, which is the median, and the third quartile. And basically, it's a one-dimensional graph. It's not two-dimensional. It's just like a straight line. But instead of a straight line, so you know, if, we, if you look at the number line, the minimum is obviously the smallest value, and the maximum is obviously the largest value. And then we have the first quartile and the second quartile and the third quartile. If you were to graph them or if you were to plot them on a number line, a box plot is simply taking that number line, putting a box around Q1 and Q3, and then erasing the part of the number line that's above the minimum, above the maximum or below the minimum. So what's left is the box plot. It looks something like this. And remember, Q, the median is the second quartile. So if, you're, if you calculate your five number summary, which means you need a data set and you do some calculations, and let's say you get these five numbers, this is what the box plot would look like. It's very simple. So, so and it, you could have a box plot vertically, horizontally, diagonally. It's just the direction doesn't matter as long as it's a straight line with a box around the middle 50%. So 25% of your data is between 4.5 and 35. 25% is between 35 and 68. 25% is between 68 and 113. And the other 25% is between 113 and 225. Now, I mentioned a couple of things box plots are, use, are useful for. One of them is looking at the distribution of data. So here's two box plots. In the first one, it shows a normally distributed set. Basically, it's 
maybe not exactly symmetric, but it's very close to being symmetric, meaning like this low end and this high end are about the same length. The median is about halfway between the first quartile and the third quartile. So this is a nicely symmetric graph. So the symmetric graphs, we, we refer to them as normally distributed. Uh, this graph down here shows a data set that is skewed right. Skewed right means most of the data is to the left. Most of the data is to the left. And there are a few high, outlying, unusually high values that basically it pulls the mean this way. It pulls the average. It makes the average larger than it really is representative of the rest of the set. That's why we say it's skewed right when most of the data is to the left. And uh, so this is uh, NCAA football coaches. It looks like, and it's in thousands of dollars. So it looks like the maximum salary. And this is this is a uh, uh, this is outdated now because I think they're making uh, maybe more than double this, but about two point eight million dollars. Uh, the lowest is one hundred and twenty-five thousand. So it looks like most of the most of the coaches. Let me erase some of this for now. Most of the coaches are in here, and then we have some outliers on the high end. So, examining the distribution of the set. Another nice thing about box plots is that since they're one-dimensional, you can put a bunch of them together next to each other, and you can compare them. So this shows the, the distributions of the box plots for the hours of sleep each of the seven days of the week. Maybe this is for college students or something like this. So we're able to compare the sets uh, using multiple box plots at once. Now you'll notice there's some little little dots here on the graph. These are what are called modified box plots. And a modified box plot uses a special symbol such as an asterisk or a little dot or a little circle. A modified box plot is what you get when you first identify the outliers, then get rid of them. Right? You, 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 you remove outliers from your set and then you calculate all of the sample statistics, the measures of center, the measures of variation, the spread, the percentiles, the five number summary. Because outliers, they strongly affect many of those quantities. So you, you want to remove them so you have more accurate results, but they still exist. So you don't just delete them and assume they never existed. You have all of your data without outliers. And then you have a symbol just to say, okay, well, there were two outliers we removed from the set before constructing that box plot. And that's what a, a modified box plot is. But you cannot make a box plot without first coming up with the five number summary, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, the maximum, the minimum, you need those numbers first. And a box plot is basically a picture of the five number summary. And a modified box plot is a picture of the five number summary once you've removed the outliers. All right, that about does it for our discussion. So we've talked about uh, a lot of different topics in this context of descriptive statistics. We talked about the context of the data. Where is it coming from? Is it a sample or a population? We've talked about discrete data versus continuous data. We've talked about uh, qualitative versus quantitative. We've talked about the levels of measurement. We've talked about how to collect data, different sampling methods, uh, visualizations, different graphs, Scatter plot histogram. We've also talked about, you know, pie graph, pie charts and bar graphs and things like this. Uh, measures of center. We had mean, median, mode, and mid range. The mean is the important one moving forward. That they're all important, but for the rest of the course, we, we cover the next 15 chapters in the book. The mean is going to be rel 
the mean is going to be mentioned in every single chapter. Same with the standard deviation. These are the these are the two big ones moving forward, and z-score is also very, very important moving forward. Uh, all right, so that about does it. Uh, we have one more, one more lecture in this series. So there's four lectures. This is number three. We have the mean, or sorry, the measures of center was the video number one. Measures of variation, video number two. This one, measures of relative standing, this is video three. And then the fourth and final installment of this series will be correlation and regression. So that is the, uh, the next topic to watch. At least if you're in my class, if you're just watching these videos on, on YouTube, you watch whatever you want in whatever order. But uh, in my class, this would be the third of the four, uh, four uh, large videos on descriptive statistics. All right.